Ah, uh, uh, Professor Layton in the unknown future. Yes, um, hey guys. <laughs> what the fuck is up, you guys? My name is Aaron Dan 64 2 <sighs> Let me tell you, this game, Professor Layton and the Unwound Future, is a game. <sighs> this game is amazing. It is one of my favorites of all time. This was the first Layton game I played, which is weird because it is the third in the original trilogy and the last in the six mainline games. This game just blows every other game out of the water. This game is massive in scope. Curious Village was a simple and contained story. Diabolical Box was more bigger and epicer, but in Unwanted Future, this game is exponentially bigger in every way. In the Diabolical Box review, I said how it was a close call between that game's story and this game. Well, I love Diabolical Box and its story very much, but I lied. This game's story is so much better. Diabolical Box's story was much more fantasy-like with the creepy town full sense vampires and the spooky box. While this game is more based in the real world, kind of-ish. The whole game takes place in London, which of course is a massive city with a huge population, while St. Mystier and Full Sense were pretty remote places, so this game affects a lot more people. Layton receives a letter, just like he always does, but this time, it's not from a random person, nor Layton's good friend, it's from Luke. Yes, Luke Triton, Layton's apprentice. But what makes this interesting is it's from 10 years into the future. Future Luke says London has been thrown in utter chaos, and Layton is the only one who could help. Layton believes this letter is tied to the event that happened a week prior. That event was the display of a time machine by the scientist Dr. Alan Stungun. Stungun asks Prime Minister Bill Hawks to be the volunteer of the demonstration. Bill Hawks steps into the time machine, and when Stungun turns it on, it starts making noises and explodes. Stungun and Hawks both vanish without a trace, as well as some of the best scientists in the country shortly after the event. I really like this premise a lot. There's a lot of games and movies and shit that do time travel, and sometimes it's really, really good, and sometimes it's utter garbage. And when it's done right, I find it really intriguing. And this game is a perfect example. So Luke and Layton go to the clock shop on Midland Road, as it is instructed on the letter, in the clock shop, there is a massive clock that acts as the time machine in the game, and with one pull of a lever, they are sent 10 years into the future. I love this game's story. It isn't that unique of a plot itself, but everything that happens throughout the game and that is revealed later on makes it so intriguing and good. I'll talk about what happens in further detail later. The only future I want is one without this game. Uh -huh. I'm going to briefly talk about the gameplay and everything because it's the same as the previous two. There is a better selection of puzzles in this game, as well as more of them. A problem that I forgot to mention about all the lane games is with all the random puzzles people give you, it could kind of break the immersion when someone is just like, hey, solve this puzzle. I know part of the charm of these games is all the wacky characters you meet, but it's still kind of weird. The problem isn't that prevalent in this game, but it's still somewhat there. It makes more sense in the first two games because you're in these mysterious towns with mysterious backstories that were unfamiliar to Luke and Layton, but this game takes place in London, where Layton lives. Speaking of the characters, this game has such 
better characters. The side characters are much more memorable too, which was a problem in the previous games. I'll talk about each of the characters more in a bit. New to this game are the puzzle battles. They're like a puzzle, but now it's a battle with someone else, kinda. There are only a few of them in this game, but they are fun, but I wish they were more of a battle per se. It's pretty much just a glorified puzzle to be honest. But they were only used a few times in later games, which sucks because they could have been really good if they were expanded on to have more gameplay elements, which is another problem I have with the original trilogy. There just wasn't that much variety in the gameplay, which is also somewhat fixed in later games. You know the drill about the three mini games. In this game, they are more of mini games instead of collecting a bunch of items. Some weirdo in a bar gives Luke a picture book that you put a bunch of stickers in in a specific order so it makes a coherent story. It's pretty kiddy as Luke says so himself, but it's, it's cool, so yeah. Completing this will unlock the storyteller's house and Lane's challenges. The owner of the hotel Luke and Lane stays at gives Luke a toy car, and there are 10 different tracks where you collect a bunch of items and make it to the finish. This is one of my favorite minigames in the series. It's fun. Completing it will unlock the hotelier's house. Luke befriends a parrot. The parrot acts as a delivery bird in the minigame. There are 12 different things to deliver to various people. Completing this will unlock the delivery bird's house. London in this game is awesome. Future London to be more specific. It is that off feeling that you need in a lane game, but it's different. It feels more like a normal place that you could see in real life with a touch of weirdness for good measure. I also love how diverse the place is. You have the main Midland Road and Southern Street area, Auckland Lane, the Path to Chinatown and the Black Market, the Thames River and Research Facility, and Chinatown. That's just in future London. In present London, you visit Midland Road again, Scotland Yard, and Gresson Hill University. You're in present London for very little of a game, but it's really cool. It's really cool to see the university that Layton works at. There, we are introduced to Dean Delmona, Layton's teacher. And it's cool to see the place Inspector Chelmy works at, Scotland Yard. Back in future London, Layton and Luke meet up with future Luke at a casino. He explains that London is now ruled by an evil genius who overthrew the government and rules with an iron fist. And that evil genius is none other than Professor Layton himself, who in the future is obsessed with power and time travel. I really like this idea that the tyrannical ruler of the future wasn't Don Paolo like Luke thought or some new villain, but it's the future version of the main character, Herschel Layton. A man who we have only known to be an upstanding, humble gentleman, who is pretty pure in every single way. So the fact that he is an evil genius ruling London definitely raises suspicion, as it should. I mean, he is definitely a genius, but he ain't evil. But this would explain why so many people treat Leighton with so weirdly and are so afraid of him. Future Leighton has his own mafia organization called The Family. A high-ranking family member, Bostro, sees Leighton and how he's dressed as his boss, Leighton, and starts shooting at them after they resist arrest. I remember how intense the scene was as a kid. The slot machine puzzle felt like a live or die moment. It definitely wasn't a hard puzzle, and it was pretty early on in the game, but it still feels intense. I still feel that intenseness when I replay it, but it's still a little weird that a slot machine gun that Layton built on the spot manages to overpower a small army of goons with actual guns. The scene is a bit dumb, but I'll admit I still like it. Layton and the two Lukes explore more of London. They decide to go back to the present because Layton believes this case is linked to an event that happened 10 years prior to the game. Prior to the present, that is. To be more specific, another explosion of another time machine. So Layton and Luke, now in the present, go to Rest and Heller University, and who do they find there? None other than Flora. Who? Oh yeah, the token girl character who was pretty pointless in Diabolical Box and just acts as a damsel in distress. Yeah, her. In this game, she's upset about the professor not taking her on another adventure, but she really just comes across as whiny and annoying. There's nothing really wrong with Luke and Lane having someone tagging along with them. I do like Emmy from the prequels a lot more. She's not perfect by any means, but she's not bad. I liked Flora's role in Curious Village, obviously as it made sense, but in Diabolical Box and Unknown Future, she's kind of annoying and doesn't really have much of a point besides being a damsel in distress. 
Like Luke and Emmy are actually important and help move the plot along, but not really for all. Anyway, so they meet up with her and she goes off to make cucumber sandwiches and then Leighton and Luke leave when they get what they need. Which I find funny because even Layton is like, let's leave before she comes back. Which ain't that gentlemanly, <laughs> now is it Layton? He says it's for her own safety, which I believe. But it's more so because she's an annoying burden. So they leave, and then they head to Scotland Yard. There, they talk to Inspector Chilney, and Layton tells Chilney about his theory that the Prime Minister, Bill Hawks, is being held captive in the future. We also learn more about Chilney and Barton's relationship. Barton is not an important character. In Diabolical Box and Unwound Future, he's just Shelmy's sidekick, pretty much. But at least we see more of him and them in this game. Layton and Luke head back to the clock shop, and guess who followed them? Shelmy and Barton and Flora. Who? So they all come to the future. Shelmy and Barton go off to conduct their own investigation, and Flora is now tagging along on this adventure. They head to Chinatown, which is such a cool place. I love the music and atmosphere. It's a really cool place. I just wish it was bigger and more happened in the actual Chinatown area. Future Layton resides in the Towering Pagoda, a massive tower in the north part of Chinatown. But Layton isn't there right now, so they learn that he often likes to go to the restaurant on the Thames River called Thames Arms. So they go there and see a cute little rabbit. Oh, look at the cute little rabbit. Oh, shit. So, throughout the games, Luke talks to animals, but they obviously can't talk back. Except for the hamster in Diabolical Box. You know, when he says, get any snacks around here. <clears throat> but, this rabbit is an exception. He is a talking rabbit named Subject 3, who has had many experiments done on him, by a certain someone who we'll talk about later in the spoiler section. It feels... A little bit out of place and weird for this talking rabbit to be here, but I like how it adds a darker side to the story, and more of which I'll talk about later. I just wish he was more important because you you don't talk to him after this. So then Gang goes into the restaurant and oh no, Future Lane just left. So they go back to the Tower of Pagoda. I know. Going out to Thames Arms was to set up the end of the game, Subject 3, and River Thames, and the lighthouse across it. But it feels a little bit pointless to go out there and then all the way back. Before they enter the pagoda, Layton mysteriously disappears, and then comes back at the tower. In the tower are a series of challenging puzzles as well as amazing music. At the top are some spoilers. And before, I want to talk about the presentation and music. The graphics are pretty much the same as Diabolical Box. The locations, though, are much more unique and interesting, like I said before. The cutscenes are amazing, as always, and we have a lot more of them, which I love. The opening scene of London is amazing. It feels straight out of, like, an actual anime. And speaking of London, I've never been there, nor in Europe at all, but they do a really good job at encapsulating that feeling of London and that time period. The time period is still unknown, but London looks great. I wish more cutscenes were actual cutscenes instead of just them talking, but that's okay. I wish more of the scenes were voice acted, like at least the ones with the characters who already have voice actors. Now the music in this game is outstanding. It's really hard to pick a single lane game for my favorite soundtrack, but this one is probably my favorite. The music always fits the mood so well. Whether it's calm or intense, it always fits. Don't get me started on that main theme of the game. It's only used during a cutscene at the end of the game, but it's so amazing. It's not a normal video game song that will repeat over time. Not that that's a bad thing, you know. I love this game's soundtracks and many game soundtracks, but that main theme is an actual piece of music, and it's so amazing start to finish. Now, on to the spoiler section. You know the drill. Go to the time skip. <sighs> so, at the top of the tower, Bank Pagoda, they meet up with future Layton, but presently reveals him to be none other than Dr. Allen Stungun, or his real name, Dimitri Allen, the man responsible for the explosion and disappearance of Bill Hawks a week earlier, and the one who did those experiments on Subject 3. 
Dimitri posed as future Lane to lure the real Lane into future London. Dimitri tried to get Lane's memories so he could recreate the failed experiment from 10 years ago, which is the one Lane went back to the present to investigate. In this experiment, a woman named Claire was killed, who was Lane's girlfriend at the time. Dimitri loved her as well. His goal was to save her as well as his life goals, being the time machine. Dimitri reveals that he has Bill Hawks hostage, then captures Lane and the gang in a steel cage. But as it turns out, Lane isn't actually Lane. He was Don Palo all along. Not actually all along, but since Lane left for a bit before entering the Tower of Pagoda. Dimitri escapes with Bill Hawks and then activates an alarm sending the family gang after them. They find a secret passageway and escape from it. While outside, Lane reveals that Don Paolo was hired by Dimitri to disguise as future versions of Andrew Schrader and Dean Delmona. Don Paolo explains his backstory and motivations for hating Leighton. Don Paolo, also known as Paul, was a student who was a year older than Leighton. He was a genius and very good with machines as well as a master in disguise. He also loved Claire, so he hated Leighton for having her and Paul not. And that is the only reason he helped Dimitri was to help save Claire, which is just kind of cringe. I like Don Paolo as more of an anti-hero that he is in this game than more of the villain, but I don't really like his backstory. It would have been much better if it was Layton being better than Paul and no one liking Paul and Paul not getting any sort of recognition for being an obvious genius or something along those lines. But this is his backstory that was building up for three games. In like the first game, Lane acts like he doesn't even know who fucking Don Paolo is. Don Paolo then leaves to go work on a project. Layton finds out about the secret time machine facility on the other side of the Thames River. So they go across the tunnel underneath the river. At the facility, they meet up with Don Paolo, but are caught by the family. A mysterious woman who says she is Claire's sister, Celeste, helps them escape. They split up, and Celeste tells them to meet back up at the Old Father's Embrace, which Lane deduces to be the Thames Arms. Lane explains that the explosion that killed Claire 10 years ago also destroyed a block of flats in the apartment building, and how he remembers a child crying about his parents who were killed in the explosion, and how Lane talked the kid down from going back in the building. Lane attempted to investigate the event, but it was covered up by political forces. Everyone meets up at the Thames Arms, and now it's time for Lane to reveal the truth. He reveals that this future London is a fake, and that the clock shop is one big elevator leading down into this massive movie set-like city. Which I really think is a neat idea. <clears throat> Lane reveals the barkeeper to be Dimitri Allen. Then Dimitri explains the full event that happened 10 years ago. Dimitri, Bill Hawks, and Claire we're all working together on a time machine project. Dimitri found a flaw in the design of the machine, but Bill didn't listen. He went on with the experiment using Claire as a test subject. Bill activated the machine and it exploded. How Bill didn't die, but people not in the room died is a mystery, but sadly he survived. Bill sold the machine and made a shit ton of money. He used that money to cover up this story and to climb the political ladder to the top. Dimitri's backstory is much better than Don Paolo's. Dimitri lost the woman he loved. Dimitri is also closer to Claire than Don Paolo was, as well as he lost all of his life's work. So it's much more justified that he would want to get revenge on the man who took everything from him and killed Claire, Bill Hawks. Layton, of course, reveals that there was someone else pulling the strings I love the scenes of Lane exposing someone. They are always so good. Anyways, Lane exposes future Luke to be Clive, whose parents were killed in the explosion. He was adopted by a wealthy woman named Constance Dove, but she passed away shortly after. Clive inherited all of her money. He used that money to build this fake future London. After being revealed, Clive kidnaps Flora, then runs out to the restaurant. He takes a boat to the lighthouse, then a giant mech emerges from the ground. Layton and Luke get on top of the mech using the Lane mobile and save Laura and Bill Hawks. The whole thing starts to collapse, but Celeste goes back to save Clive. The scene where Clive watches as his creation collapses is such an amazing scene. First off, 
The animation is just outstanding. When he screams, it won't end this way, is so powerful. You truly see and feel his pain. You don't quite know what he means exactly. You would assume he means about the fortress being destroyed, but it could have been regret for the many people he has killed. You see him question his own sanity and what he is doing. He could very well realize that what he is doing is no better than what Bill Hawks has done to him. But it's definitely not worse, that's for sure. And everyone escapes the forest and it explodes. Clive tells Layton that he was the boy that Layton helped after the explosion. I really like Clive's arc. I thought the fortress thing was kinda out of nowhere, but everything else I really liked. Clive is not a bad person. He was just consumed by his emotions, so he didn't think clearly. Pretty! Like, he probably killed a ton of people with the attack on Lena at the end, but you still understand his motives. I really like Dimitri and Clive's characters. They are really well written, and it's sad what happens to them. But oh no no, if you think that is sad, Lane finds out that Claire never actually had a sister. Celeste reveals herself to be Claire. After the explosion, Claire was actually sent to the future, which is now the present. But Claire can't stay because her body is stabilizing in the present. So we have a heart-wrenching scene where Layton says goodbye to Claire. This scene makes me cry every fucking time. It's definitely one of the saddest and best endings in any video game. What really makes this sad is that Layton is such a good wholesome person and seeing him in so much pain is so sad. Obviously he had much more of a connection with Claire than Dimitri or Don Paolo did, so it makes sense and it's much more impactful. This was the first and only time we saw Layton in love. This is the first and only time we saw Layton angry. And of course this is the first and only time we saw Layton cry. And the first time we saw him take his hat off, which we learned was a gift from Claire. The fact that such a calm and collected man who's always kept his cool in intense situations is this emotional shows how much he truly cares about Claire. We never see anything like this ever again from Layton. He has accepted the future for what it is and understands that he can't change the past. He sees how much pain can come from dwelling on the past with Don Paolo and Dimitri but he has moved on but it's still hits him as we could see. This scene is what cements this game's ending as one of the best endings of all time. Maybe the best. So we have Clive and Dimitri who are the villains in this game, but they are both not bad people. But the true villain of this game is none other than Bill Hawks. He is all around a terrible person. He killed Claire and then used the money he made for his own selfish gain. He acts all high and mighty in this game, the little that he is in it. The writers did a good job in making him such an unlikable person. They just want to beat over the head with a mallet. The fact that he survived the explosion 10 years ago and the events of this game is his salt in the open wound. Again, I like how much more grandiose this game is compared to the others. The end of this game definitely impacted a ton of people like for fuck's sakes there's a massive hole in london where many people used to live i also love how this game focuses more on lane and his past curious village had nothing to do with lane and diabolical box only did happen because lane's good friend and mentor had the elysian box but in this game he's vital to the story i love how all the characters are connected to each other through their past and I love how we see more of Layton's past and we see a younger Layton. And it's so cool to see. After the credits, we say another goodbye with Layton and Luke. Because Luke's father is transferring jobs. Again, it's so sad to see this goodbye to these characters that we spent all this time with. After that, we see a letter Luke sent to Layton sometime after the events of the Unwound Future. Detailing a new mystery. What this mystery is, no one knows. The next game in the series are prequels, and Lane's mystery journey takes place way, way after that, so who knows? <sighs> okay, this has been a really long video, and I need a break. Um, I love this game so much. It is the best Lane game, in my opinion. The puzzles are fun, the story is amazing, 
the graphics and the music are amazing. This game still holds up very well after the numerous times I've played it. I am going to give Professor Lin and the Unwound Future a 10 out of 10. This is not a perfect game by a long shot, but fuck you. This is my review. Guys, uh, future E-Man here. Ooh, I just want to mention one thing I forgot about. Um, these games have evolved a lot um, from the simple story that is Curious Village to the massive story in Unknown Future. I really just realized the differences in these games after playing them back to back like I am. Not only the story, but the themes and the characters. The weight of this game is more than your mom's. Oh! I love this game so much. It is one of my favorite games of all time. Everyone should play this game. It is $13.99 on mobile, and it is very worth it. Now I'm gonna take a break and never make a video again. Just kidding. Or am I? Uh, <clears throat> this has been Professor Layton and the Unwound future. Fuck you!